I um, have two questions. The first is, um, do you believe national sovereignty to believe uh, to be the most important value? And the second one is, uh, what do you think about about the Kantian idea of global citizenship? And do you believe yourself to be a global citizen or rather a citizen of the UK? Right. Um, national sovereignty is not the only value. It is a serious political value in my view because it, it is the thing which enables you to say we, not just I and him and he, she and so on, but we, we're, we're doing this together. You've got to have some way of identifying the first person plural if you're to make coherent action in the face of threat. You can't do that by identifying yourself as a global citizen. That's just a way of copping out, of saying it's not my problem, it's the world's problem. Um, and people don't uh, give their lives for, the, for, for their global citizenship. They do for their national sovereignty, and that's a very important fact. What Kant meant in perpetual peace was not that people should uh, relinquish national sovereignty entirely. He, his view was that, that uh, there should be a league of nations but the league would be of genuine nation states, which he defined as republics. They were, in other words, states which fully represented the people that, they, uh, that were members of them. And I, I'm totally in favor of that, uh, as long as it's, it does not involve the relinquishing of sovereignty. So I think uh, um, I, I'll be happy to, to um, go along with what Kant is really meaning. Uh, and I, but I would be aware of uh, in doing so, of getting rid of the only thing that enables us to fight anything in the first place. I'm all in favor of idealism, uh, as long as you can confine it in a place, in a talking shop, uh, among uh, intellectuals. You, you know, the Nexus Institute is a perfect place for idealism, um, but when it escapes from that enclosed uh, container into the outside world, you know, it can be incredibly dangerous because most people are not capable of, of thinking in an idealistic way. Most people are um, self-interested uh, and um, rightly so probably uh, and without the capacity to entertain these great ideas. So I, I think of ideals uh, as a kind of uh, agreeable poison like wine and to be consumed among consenting adults in private. You've mentioned so many reasons why the UK should actually leave the EU, EU mm. and I'm almost convinced, but I'm sure that even you have some reasons to stay. Yes. So what are those? And please, no economic reasons. Mm. <laughs> no, right. Oh, well, of course, my love of Europe and the ease of traveling around Europe is a wonderful thing. This is something that's happened in my lifetime, and um, that is a reason for me, uh, of course, personally. Um, uh, and, um, and friendships that, are, that have been built up across Europe. I mean, my, my father's, or well, my parents' generation, there weren't those sort of friendships. I, I have a, a network of friends in um, France, Italy, Poland, Czech Republic, you know, Slovakia, um, here in the Netherlands, Belgium up to a point, you know, this is, uh, this is something that my parents could never have envisaged and I do find that uh, a great um, inspiration. But on the other hand, I'm an intellectual who reads books and likes languages and I'm not sure that the same is true of uh, the mass of ordinary English people. Advantages of, uh, for UK of staying in the European Union. Gosh, um, I have thracked my head about this, uh, uh, and um, so far I haven't found one. But um, uh, you know, there are things that can that look like advantages. But as you say, if I'm not allowed to say with things that economists say, then uh, I can't really give an answer. From what you said, I understand that the only reason to stay is purely economical. Well, what I conclude from this is that all these ideals and principles can just simply be bought 
which is quite a sad conclusion mm. to <laughs> reach after one hour. Am I that wrong? Yes, you are wrong, because I am talking about ideals and principles. And talking about, uh, I was talking about national sovereignty, the rule of law and the nature of law, uh, as we in Britain know and love it, um, the nature of the, uh, uh, of the country, uh, the, the language and the culture that, that is uh, I installed there. These are not economic factors. These are what go to define uh, the, my sense of the moral idea of my country. Uh, and uh, I, w I don't want to lose that moral idea. It is to that idea that I appeal in times of need and you know, when, I, when I'm wondering whether I shouldn't emigrate anyway. You know, those, are, those are the things that matter. And I, I think um, all of us have that. I, I know this because I, I'm, although I'm a, an English patriot, I, I, I'm also a, a French nationalist. Uh, and a, a Czech nationalist. You know, these are things which, which um, are deep in my soul because of my own experience. I love those countries too, and I have the same sense that there are, they represent something more than just economic uh, uh, arrangements between people. So I don't think I'm, it's fair to accuse me of reducing everything to uh, you know, things that can be bought and sold. On the contrary, I think it's, this whole debate is precisely about the things which can't be bought and sold you know better than anybody else, Europe's history. And we know the history of what happened in Italy. And we know about those dark forces which are everywhere now in uh, 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 Europe. The only, look, I'm on your side with all the criticism we can have at the European Union. Uh, we will publish, uh, Thomas already mentioned, uh, a book mm. in which we will claim, look, it's not a European Union, it's an economic union, it has nothing to do with the idea of Europe, etc., etc., etc. But is all of that argument enough to give up, you know, the, the one fragile institute we are having now, which, which keeps the whole bloody thing a little bit together? Mm. Um, we have seen the Balkan Wars, and, you know, we don't need that much to pull a lot of uh, 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 trouble off. And again, Brexit easily could be, you know, that kind yeah. of force to, for... Yeah, I just don't agree with that prediction. Uh, I think that to, uh, we've now lived together in a state of peace for long enough to recognize that, that all these um, conflicts are amenable to a negotiated solution. Uh, we are, uh, it, it's, and when it comes to the big questions confronting us now, uh, the European Union's way of dealing with them are um, actually pushing us in the direction that you, you are frightened of, the, 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 restor the re resuscitation of tribalism. But as I say, I don't have a clear monopoly over the future, and I think nobody in this room has, that really we've got to think about principles and what it is that gives people a sense of identity in the first place. You've been talking about saving Europe. What should we young people from Europe do to mm. save Europe? Well, you, you should, um, first of all, gosh, what should you You should marry and have children. Uh, um, not necessarily in that order. I, re I recognize <laughs> that, that, th that things not have that changed. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, and you should hold on to the great culture of Europe and, if possible, to the religion of Europe and to the great tradition of Roman law and say that these are things that we have and we believe them and we want to pass them on. That's what I would say.